this for me? And he said, yeah. And then I got Danny to come into this because we really wanted to have another historian really be in dialogue about the impact of those events so many decades ago on the world that we're still living in today. So I'm gonna start with uh, some very short bios of our speakers. You can find out more about them through our friend, Mr. Google. Uh, but here's a couple of facts for you. John Wiener is a longtime contributing editor at The Nation, and he is host and producer of Start Making Sense, the magazine's weekly podcast. He is an emeritus professor of US history here at UC Irvine, and his books include Give Me Some Truth, the John Lennon FBI Files, and How We Forgot the Cold War, a Historical Journey Across America. And he lives in, you guessed it, Los Angeles. And Danny Widener teaches modern American history at UCSD with a focus on expressive culture and political radicalism. He studied at Berkeley and at NYU, and he teaches courses on Cuba, African-American history, California, sports, and film. So this is a webinar, and I will be fielding questions after the conversation. You can put those questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and you can put those questions in whenever they occur to you, and then at, when we have turned to the Q&A section, I will curate from those questions and have uh, John and Danny give their responses. I'm going to, they're going to be involved in a conversation about this book, but I might pop in occasionally because I spent a lot of time reading it. And I'm going to start with my own question. Uh, so, you know, I was really surprised when I started reading this book by how much acts of police brutality in the 60s catalyzed protests and social justice movements in this region and also how resistant the LAPD seems to have been to meaningful reforms. The protests we've seen this year began decades ago in the period that you document in this book. And so I'm really curious as a kind of starter question to hear from both of you, what kind of light this book sheds on our current situation? Well, Julia, let me start by saying thank you for inviting us. It's an honor to to be the first one up here in the Illuminaries series. Uh, yeah, the LAPD had, was at the center of, uh, first of all, let me say, this is a movement history. There's, it may be long, but it leaves out a lot of things. It's not about the movies. It's not about the surfers. It's not about the Democratic Party. It's a movement history. And that means, first of all, the spine of the book is the Black and Chicano movements uh, and it was kind of a narrative history of their mobilization and the changes in their political uh, orientation over the decade. And then around that swirls all the other movements, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the gay liberation movement, the Asian American movement, the counterculture. But as you say, all of them all of them faced off with the LAPD. The LAPD was against all the movements. Most of all, of course, black people. That seems to be a continuity between then and now. Um, but also, there were, you know, young people fought the the LAPD and the LA sheriffs on Sunset Strip and on Venice Beach. <clears throat> um, white middle class anti war marchers, 10,000 of them, marched in Century City in 1967 to protest the war when Lyndon Johnson came to town. They were beaten by a thousand LAPD uh, members. It really transformed politics on the west side of LA <clears throat> for 10,000 middle class white people and their families to experience what people of color had been experiencing for, for decades in Los Angeles. And even, and of course, the gay movement, there were LAPD raids on gay bars regularly. The first, um, the first expressions of gay militant politics came in LA two years before. We usually date Stonewall as the beginning of everything, but more than two years before Stonewall, Gays in LA organized a street protest against police raids on gay bars. Um, 
So uh, in, even the women's movement, even the, the LAPD raided the, the women's health self-help clinic on Crenshaw Boulevard in around 1970 and charged them with practicing medicine without a license. So everybody had to fight the LAPD one, one way or another. Um, I'm struck today by really how much better Black Lives Matter is at organizing against the police than I dare say we were in the 1960s. You know, the idea of defund the police and uh, has had massive support. I mean, people, not just black people, not just people of color, but we have seen, you know, Newport Beach had a Black Lives Matter march uh, this past summer. Hundreds of flat. people, <laughs> hundreds of people. I mean, you know, Newport Beach, we think of as historically anyway, the most Republican, the most conservative, the most white place pretty much in Southern California. If there's Black Lives Matter in Newport Beach, something has changed uh, in Southern California and, and in America. Um, and the idea, remember, um, defund the police, there's a second part to that, which is reimagine public safety. What kind of government would you like to have in your city? What are your priorities? Uh, this, we never got this far in the 60s. In the 60s, it was basically try to stop police violence with legal action, with street protests. And it, you know, obviously it didn't succeed. I'm impressed by how much better Black Lives Matter has been doing uh, this past summer and really for the last seven years of this. Could I just add one thing there that I think is really interesting? My first teaching job was at a place called West Los Angeles College. So really small community college in Culver City. And the history department there is part of the social sciences. And it's in there with something called administration of justice. So I worked with a guy named Buck Stapleton, who'd been a police infiltrator in these years. He'd in fact been at the Century City riot that John mentions. He, he said he'd thrown some rocks at friends of his from the police academy in part to legitimize the police violence. And I said to him, so, you know, what was it like being a spy? Did you ever feel bad about breaking the law? And he said, yeah, one time I did something that I kind of regretted. I said, oh, you know, do tell. And he said, well, uh, I was sitting at my desk and these guys from animal control came by and they said, Stapleton, get off your ass. So I got up and I went with them to the Santa Monica mountains and we spent the whole morning picking up rattlesnakes. And we spent the whole afternoon driving around the house of people uh, who we had a list, anti-war folks, activist folks, looking to see if they had one of those mail slots in your front door or an empty bathroom window. And we'd shove these rattlesnakes in their houses. Ugh. Now I told my father-in-law that story. My father-in-law is from Mississippi, he was in the first sit in in Louisiana, he was expelled from Southern University. And he said, oh, Daniel, I haven't opened my mailbox with my hand in 40 years. I use a stick. So when John tells this story about the omnipresence of police violence, it's important to remember that that was almost a carryover of recruiting these people from the South to police a rapidly diversifying city, right? As you, as you got more and more Mexican people, Japanese Americans, above all African Americans, the idea was... Let's go find the people who know how to deal with these people. And I think that explains a, per, a portion of that. The second thing that's really critical is if you look at the badges of the SWAT team of Los Angeles, there's two little things there on the logo. It says 41 and uh, 77. And the 41 is 41st and Central. That was the Black Panther Party's headquarters. The first SWAT team in the United States was developed to attack the Panthers, the whole militarization of police that we see, it started here. And the guy who commanded it, Daryl Gates, he made his start on the vice squad in trapping men and busting them on morals charges so that gay men could be sent to Atascadero and given electroshock therapy. <laughs> so we're talking about a level of repression that I think at times, those of us who are younger than that moment don't really understand. You know, we rightfully pay a lot of attention to the deadly violence that 
people are experiencing at the hands of police today. And I, I think in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, in some ways it was even more open and deadly and on the street. So just wow. speak to the courage of the people who, who fought against in that moment, I think. Yeah, courage was a word that kept recurring to me throughout reading this book. Uh, how many people were willing to risk their lives, their livelihoods uh, to make change happen and how, how some of that change, I mean, do you want to talk about the stuff about housing and segregate, the segregated housing? I mean, some of those achievements were so difficult. Yeah, and LA had the most, um, some of the most segregated housing anywhere outside the deep south. Um, enforced by uh, restrictive covenants that were standard operating procedure in the real estate business in LA had been since the 20s. Um, the very first movements of the 60s that we chronicle were, were nonviolent direct action movements aimed at integrating, first of all, the schools, and second of all, housing. There was, one, there was amazing direct action around segregated the this was a period when they were opening new subdivisions all over southern california and torrance was a, spe a special focus of both the real estate industry and the civil rights movement there were uh sit-ins at the uh opening days of new developments there were building occupations of the sample houses uh, we have a picture of marlon brando on a picket line in torrance uh, it was a very big deal, and it actually succeeded in, in remember, nonviolent direct action that involved whites and blacks, lots of young people, inspired by the civil rights movement of the South. Um, they succeeded in getting the California state legislature to pass uh, a fair housing law, which banned uh, racial discrimination and at least some kinds of housing, and this was considered a great story, the triumph of nonviolent direct action to bring racial progress to Southern California. Uh, but in 1964, that was in 1963, in 1964, the Realty uh, Realtors put an initiative on the ballot to repeal the California state housing law and two thirds of white people voted in favor of repealing the open housing law in California. That was the biggest defeat that nonviolent direct action suffered in Southern California. And a year later, we get the Watts riot. So the first phase of LA movement history is nonviolent direct action to achieve desegregation. That is defeated at the ballot box by the realtors and the white voters then we get Watts, and after that, we get the rise of Black radicalism, the Black Panthers, Black nationalism, and that's kind of the second phase of Black politics, Black movement politics in Los Angeles. Yeah, I mean, Julia, you, you started by asking this question about the resonance with contemporary issues. And I think um, it's really striking if you think not just about our own moment, um, but also the 1990s. So the 1990s, very similar moment where the sharp edge of racism in California is at the ballot box. You have Prop 209 uh, eliminating affirmative action, Prop 187 and its uh, hostility to undocumented, really to all immigrant people, Prop 21 driving mass incarceration. So one of the things I think that John and Mike did a, a, a fantastic job about is really showing that it wasn't just the structures of authority, the police that were the enemy of this kind of mass social movement, but it, it was the kind of um, lower middle class Southern California homeowner who looked at everything through the lens of property values and was so easily mobilized through this kind of language and politics of fear. And I think if there's a really hopeful moment that comes from the reading of it is to understand that you know, the United States in many ways seems to be in the place that California was in from say the mid 1960s through the middle of the 1990s, you know, and look where we are now relative to um, some of the parts of the rest of the country. This is not paradise. I mean, my son and I got shot at with rubber bullets and tear gas grenades by the police in La Mesa a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's totally nonviolent demonstration. So, you know, there's a few miles left to go on this road. 
But I definitely think um, that element of mass democratic support on the part of a section of our white communities to restrict the mobility and access of people of color is a really key, key story. You know, and when we look at the issue of the affirmative action repeal on the ballot in a couple of weeks, you can see that we're still spinning through some of these questions. Um, you know, the I rise... To... Oh, go, go ahead, more. No, no, go ahead. Well, I, I, I just want to ask... Go ahead, please. You go. <laughs> I wanted to follow up on what you were saying about the ballot box, because there is a turning point when Tom Bradley runs for mayor, um, the first black mayor of Los Angeles, he'd been a city councilman representing an integrated uh, district in South Crenshaw, uh, ran for the first time in 1969 um, in the Democratic primary, LA's Democratic town. So the primary is, is everything. And the, the um, incumbent mayor, Sam Yorty, was an old time racist, you know, right wing Democrat. Um, Yorty almost was almost defeated by Tom Bradley in 1969, largely because of the aftermath of that 1967 Century City police riot, where the police attacked this huge uh, crowd of white demonstrators. They'd never been beaten up by the police before, and suddenly they realized what it was like to be a black person in Los Angeles. That led to the beginnings of a real political transformation at the ballot box. The San Fernando Valley stayed with Yorty. The West Side liberals voted for Bradley. They lost in 69. The mayor serves a four-year term. And in 73, Tom Bradley became the first uh, black mayor of Los Angeles and second or third in the, in the United States. The 73 campaign, Danny knows well, is a very different story from the 69 campaign. It was a very grassroots uh, operation, not so in 73, but it still showed that the reaction to police violence did move white liberals to endorse a black for mayor, which had never happened before in a hundred years. It's funny, my parents were at that march in Century City. Uh, Muhammad Ali was there and my dad yeah. got real excited because he got Muhammad Ali to sign his draft card, wow. which did a couple of things. First, it meant he had a souvenir, but second of all, it also meant that he could resist whatever peer pressure might come to burn his draft card, right? He says, I can't burn it. Muhammad <laughs> Ali's signature is on the thing. So then he got so excited, they said to my mother, you know, I gotta go to the can, we gotta get out of here. And so they walked over to someone they knew in Cheviot Hills, which is, for those of you who don't know, a fairly affluent West Side neighborhood. So they hike off to Cheviot Hills. By the time they get to Cheviot Hills, the police have gone nuts and are totally smashing the people, you know, destroying the whole, the whole setup. And so it's one of those moments where, you know, timing is everything in life. My dad's from Watts. He was doing something somewhere else when the Watts riot began. They were at the ambassador when Bobby Kennedy was killed, but they'd gone home. So they had this kind of like Forrest Gump ability to pass through all of these critical moments without actually physically being there when the, um, when the hammer came down. The thing about Century City too, I think again, with this sort of theme of um, then and now and the mix between is that it's, um, in 1990, essentially the same thing happens again. There's another police riot. This is the Justice for Janitors campaign, right? So the folks who are cleaning those high rises are brutally attacked by Gates's LAPD, and it spurs a total reimagining and reawakening of the labor movement. You know, I live in San Diego, where the labor movement is still a traditional building trades, hard hats, construction you know, let's go to Las Vegas and smoke a cigar kind of labor movement. Totally different than what you have in LA, right? With Maria Elena and Miguel Contreras and all of these folks from the bottom up. And so that idea of police violence as a detonator for a reimagined public civility and a different kind of political mobilization, I think is really exciting. Honestly, when you see the level of police violence that the BLM folks, the anti-ICE people, the Dakota Access Pipeline people have really suffered over the course of the last few years. So I think, you know, again, that issue of courage is so central um, 
the amount of risk people were willing to tolerate and their conviction that they had to go and they had to be um, witnesses and they had to be present. Which leads me on to a question I wanted to ask since it's on the flyer of the event, which is, um, you know, when we talk about people passing through many spaces and also being kind of individual symbols of the sacrifice and the mobilization at the time, you know, Angela Davis obviously becomes one of those people who we all look to, we learn about, we see um, is hyper visible in many ways. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, John, you, how you guys thought about the role that Angela played in the book, your own sense of what her particular trajectory meant, what it meant for the University of California or people off the campus is kind of how we locate her, I guess, in the story. Well, Angela looms large in my own experience. I moved to Southern California in August, 1969 with my girlfriend had just gotten a job uh, at UCLA. They were just starting to hire women at the University of California. And the philosophy department had also hired a woman who was starting to teach in the fall of 1969, Angela Davis. Nobody <laughs> knew who she was, uh, but we learned right away, like four weeks after I got here, the Daily Bruin published a letter from a guy who turned out to be an FBI undercover agent saying, UCLA had just hired a member of the Communist Party. Her name is Angela Davis. Now, Angela's plan was not to become the most famous radical of the 60s. Her plan was to get a job, teach about, you know, Black thought at the UCLA philosophy department. And indeed, she was a member of the Communist Party. She, then she made a very important decision. Throughout the 50s, when communists were asked the question, are you now or have you ever been? They all refused to answer. They took the fifth. They said, it's none of your business. You know, in Amer America is a free country and I can, uh, I, have, I have the right to, to keep quiet as well as to speak. Angela took the opposite course. She proudly proclaimed her membership in the Communist Party. She had been, she was part of a, a, a caucus of people of color called the Chela Mumba Caucus. And she had a very important mentor named Dorothy Healy, the head of the Southern California Communist Party, who was a, a kind of a unorthodox uh, communist who was very interested in young people, people of color, uh, the whole idea of having a, 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 a caucus that didn't have white people in it was kind of controversial at the time, but it was okay with Dorothy. <clears throat> Another person who Dorothy recruited was Mike Davis. Um, she was an inspiring figure to, to a lot of us. So. Dorothy then became, not through choice, the most famous black radical of the 60s. In the first phase of Dorothy, of, of Angela, da Angela became the most famous radical of the 60s. The first phase of her battle was to get her job back at UCLA because of course, you can't fire a professor because of their ideas. This is, we don't do that anymore. They did that in the 50s, can't do that in 1969. And indeed the courts right away said Angela had to, be uh, given her job back. Her first class, uh, she taught, She was signed up to teach a course called Philosophical Ideas in Black Literature. And her first lecture was on Frederick Douglass. 2,000 kids showed up for her first lecture. They had to move it to Royce Hall, the biggest place on campus. Um, and she was turned out to be very eloquent, a very knowledgeable, very smart, very talented person. Um, of course, the Panthers were about to be, you know, uh, attacked, as Danny said, by the by the, uh, the the SWAT squad of the LAPD, and she was very much involved with the Panthers. Um, the next phase of her career is when she is accused of um, providing the guns for this shootout at the Marin County Courthouse, which really she had nothing to do with, but she went underground, she got caught. So the next phase is Angela Davis is the most famous radical underground fugitive of the like 20th century. Uh, she gets caught, she gets put on trial, and she is found not guilty by a jury of her peers. Uh, being in prison made a big impression on Angela, and she's really devoted the rest of her life to arguing for the abolition of 
of prison and people who I, I have not been in prison, you know, I'm a middle-class white person, but people who've been in prison uh, say, you know, it's a horrible place. Don't go to prison. If you can stay out of prison, do it. And a Angela, partly because of that experience has, has become the leading advocate really in the world for prison abolition. Uh, so it's an important part of the story of Southern California. It's an important part of the story of the University of California. Danny, you were, you've been around. What, what, what's your relationship to Angela? <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I mean, I guess what I would say about that is um, my parents met in 1959 and um, some of the people who were connected to Dorothy Healy helped them find a place to live. John mentioned the problem of segregation. My father is black and my mother is white. So it was very difficult for them to find a place to live in 1950s Los Angeles that was going to be safe. My father was a student at UCLA at a time when the University of California at Los Angeles had about as many black students as UC San Diego does today. And so he was walking down Sunset Boulevard one day with one of these progress publishers, Moscow, you know, it's like Marx volumes that would come in almost like it was pornography. It was a brown paper labeled kind of thing with red letters. And this guy pulls up in the car, he sees this really skinny black guy. My dad was six foot one. He weighed about 125 pounds. And this guy looks at him. He sees this really emaciated man. He's reading Marx and he's walking down Sunset Boulevard and he goes, Egad, you know, a proletarian. And he says, oh, what are you reading? And my dad, oh, German ideology. He says, well, what are you doing around here? And my dad says, oh, actually, I'm looking for an apartment. This is how my dad looks for an apartment reading like this. <laughs> so this guy says, oh, well, I got a place you can live. And uh, my father says, well, you know, I got this white wife. He says, well, I don't give a shit about that. This guy was named Ruben Most. He was one of the heads of the Northeast section, the Hollywood area of the, of the CP. So they got this apartment from this guy who'd been in the CP and they met through him, all of these folks, including Healy. And so... I grew up in that world. Now, my parents met in 59, and I was born in 1973. So part of how I think about this story is that people were really busy <laughs> in between those years. You get to 1973, it's like, okay, well, you know, exhale. What should we do now? Uh, I don't know. What should we do now? So here I am. So um, to bring that back around, you know, um, when you read my biography, everyone always mentions New York and they always mention Berkeley. And nobody ever reads out the part where it says Echo Park People's, uh, Silver Lake People's Child Care Center, which is where I started school. And we went to this child care center where, like, they read us things that Angela was writing. They read us stuff that Betita <laughs> Martinez was writing. We sang De Colores and El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido as little kids. <laughs> and they would go through our lunches, the political officers at the daycare, and they would take out any kind of sugary treat you had, and they would redistribute those later. So I was a very reactionary four-year-old. I would come home and tell my parents, don't give me anything good. Just save it till I get home because today you gave me a muffin and they took it and they gave me a butterscotch. So I was ready for socialism. I mean, when I went to Cuba <laughs> as a young person, I went, oh yeah, this is just like Echo Park. So um, I kind of grew up in that world where Angela was a person who was, um, I didn't meet her till later, till I was a student, but was part of that world of folks that we, okay. we were around. Um, and I got an appreciation for the link between the counterculture and the, the kind of creative attempt to change America and the movement, right? The political side. And that's something I wanted, John, to ask you guys about how you thought about it, how you handled it in the book, how you approach it, because, you know, my parents identified as political people and they were always a little critical of the folks who were not wearing clothes or, the you know, hippies. the hippies, the hippies, right. they were anti-hippie. And so, um, I'm just curious how you thought about the relationship between those kind of wings, so to speak. Yeah. And maybe talk a little bit too, John, about how, you know, how you met Mike and how this came to be as a book project. 
These are two very oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> they're still related to me because, well, <laughs> because where where should I start? It's it's well let me start with how my my meeting with Mike and and then we'll talk about the counterculture and the yeah. new left politicos. Um yeah. so when I came out here in 69, my uh, I had worked in the underground press as a you know a movement activist in my college and graduate student days in in Cambridge, and my idea was I will I, I was going to be the stringer for Liberation News Service in Los Angeles. Liberation News Service was kind of the there used to be a thing called the wire service where you had people who reported on what was going on, and and they sent out packet you would mail in your packet of your report. And they sent out their packets twice a week to something like 300 underground newspapers all over the United States. And you never knew when you something would, you wrote would appear in the Great Speckled Bird in Atlanta or, you know, in the San Francisco, uh, what was it called? The, the, the East, East Village Other in, in, yep. in New York City. Anyway, that was my idea. I was going to report on what's going on in L.A. for, for, the, internet, for the underground press syndicate. And, of course there was a lot going on. There was Angela Davis, there was the Panthers, there's the anti-war movement. Uh, and one of my first, <clears throat> one of the things that was going on was Los Angeles had, I was very, one of the things that surprised me about writing this book, a militant, violent terrorist organization of right-wing Cubans, anti-Castro Cubans based in Los Angeles. Um, and they firebombed, uh, they attacked all kinds of businesses that did business with Cuba and left-wing groups that were pro-Castro. Um, and they burned down um, uh, a movement center called the Haymarket, which was near downtown. And one of my jobs was to go down there and interview the people who'd been around for this for this attack. And the, per the spokesman, the head of the Haymarket, was this guy named Mike Davis. <laughs> so one of the first things I did on my job uh, was to interview Mike Davis, who I found very, very intense, very eloquent, and frankly, a little uh, intimidating. Um, and, you know, uh, I discovered this many, many years later when I, you know, pulled out the folder of these, these moldering old uh, mimeograph pages. Um, we didn't become friends so many years later, but, but that was our, our meeting point in the you know, the Haymarket, the reason that they were attacked by the by the gusanos, we called them, the worms, the right wing Cubans, was that they were showing a movie about Fidel. Um, terrible thing to do, of course, you know, just un unacceptable. Um, the counterculture, you know, the police, the police didn't see the same differences that some of the activists did. Uh, I know, for instance, on Venice Beach, we think of Venice was kind of a long time center of counterculture. In America, there were beat poets in, in uh, Venice in the 50s. There was a jazz scene, West Coast jazz was, you know, uh, was you, you could live here in, in Venice in the, in the 50s. So uh, it was a place where uh, there, was a, there was a black community, a black ghetto that had been there since the 20s. It was a bohemian part of town. It was, had a free beach. Anybody could go there, it was a wonderful place. And um, but the police showed up regularly. I can remember going down there on Sundays and the, there would be a police sweep of the beach. And their official reason would be there had been complaints about the drum circles. Now, drum circles is a code word for black people, I believe. Black men, actually, black young men. Uh, so um, and then white and black, you know, would unite and fight the police on the beach. And this happened, you know, at least once a month for for uh, a couple of years. The police didn't see there was much of a difference between the drummers and <clears throat> all the other people they were uh, they were against. So, and similarly, the, the sort of lead institutions of the counterculture in LA, the underground press, that's the LA free press. Uh, this was really a very political uh, thing. I mean, it had lots of, ads for rock clubs and rock albums and it reviewed movies and um you know it was a voice of the of the underground culture but the guy who founded it art Konkin, was a member of the old left an older guy he'd been actually a member of the first of the socialist workers party and then of the socialist party <clears throat> kind of a, a non-communist leftist uh it's a very political newspaper really 
uh, and he made sure that it 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 uh, stayed that way. Um, the KPFK, the left wing um, radio station, uh, another voice of the counterculture. Um, that also, you know, what got them? They started out not intending to be a left wing radio station, uh, but they were gonna they were gonna be uh, they were gonna provide balanced commentary from the right and the left. Uh, so they had <clears throat> they had people like William F. Buckley giving you know taped speeches an hour long. And then they invited Dorothy Healy to have a show. She called it communist commentary. It was 15 minutes every other week. Um, the right wingers refused to be on a radio station with a, with a show called communist commentary. So they all quit. So suddenly KPFK was the voice of, you know, communism in Southern California, uh, not by choice. They redefined their conception of balance to mean we'll provide the balance that's missing from the rest of the media. And that today is KPFK's um, kind of mission, uh, uh, I would say. So, you know, yeah, there was a big, a lot of the music scene um, was not very political, but they were part of this world of being against the war, um, you know, against authority, very anti, anti-authoritarian. We, we take our title, Set the Night on Fire, for, of course, from the Doors, who are associated very much with Venice Beach. Um, you know, they were they were not like, uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Julia. They, they, they were not like some of the people Danny writes about in his book. Uh, Danny is, well, you know, one of the great historians of, of the popular cult, left culture uh, and, and, and black culture of this period. I mean, somebody like Horace Tapscott, jazz man, played a million political benefits for the Peace and Freedom Party, the Angela Davis Defense Committee. I mean, everything you could imagine. The Doors didn't do stuff like that, but everybody knew the Doors were against the war in Vietnam. The Doors were against the draft. You know, the police knew it. The, every, their fans knew it. Uh, so I think the the connections were there, even if they weren't very explicit and even if they weren't very well articulated. And even if Jim Morrison never really thought of himself as a leftist, he thought of himself as, you know, a poet, uh, kind of a cultural radical. Uh, but but everyone knew where Jim Morrison stood on, on the war in Vietnam. Right. I have a question for both of you guys, and then um, I think we'll go into some questions from the audience because there's a, quite a few here now. Um, this is one of those kind of what if questions, a little silly, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So if you could have dinner or some other kind of festivity without social distancing with one person in this book, who would it be and why? What, what, who inspires you most? Who would be the person you'd like to, to hang out with? So John and then Danny. Why can't Danny go first? <laughs> Danny, do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. And um, I think that if I thought about it longer, I might well come up with a different answer. Yeah. Um, but the answer that I will come up with at the first asking is, um, I would like to have had dinner in the moment that this book takes place with Horace Tapscott, who's someone who I knew in later years and who um, you know, I wrote about and learned about and who the first time I met him, I asked him a question. It was at Catalina's, a jazz club. It's closed now on Off of Sunset. And he said, are you writing a book? And I said, yeah. And he said, boy, that's going to take a long time because you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, I think, you know, as a person who, as I said, I was born in the 70s, came to know many of these people after this moment. Um, when you know people who have lived in an epic time, you meet them in many ways after they've begun the process of understanding their victories and defeats at a personal as well as a social level. And so many of the people who um, I have gotten to know who, who John has written about I saw them when they were now people who are my age, their mm. late thirties, mid forties, young, early fifties. Um, and they were reflective. Uh -huh. And I would have liked to have had the opportunity to meet them also when they were combative uh -huh. as well as reflective, even though some of them, Horace, Mike and others 
manage to maintain that combative spirit, you know, um, indefinitely. But nonetheless, that's what I think. Beautiful. And what about you, John? You know, uh, we've already talked about Dorothy Healy, but I really miss Dorothy and I would love to see her again. Dorothy was a wonderful person to talk to. She was full of ideas. She loved to argue. You know, I think, especially for Mike, Mike says he wrote this whole book thinking of a conversation or maybe a debate with Dorothy. I know exactly what he means. You know, she's kind of the presence that yeah. sort of looms the the spirit she, that looms she over talks, our talk a lot in many of the chapters. That's really true. Um, and you know, she was always willing. She liked a good argument, and you know, it was fine to disagree with her. She'd show you the error of your ways, and. She was pretty convincing, actually. And I would like to talk to her about a lot of this stuff. I'd like to talk to her about what's going on right now, because I'm sure she'd really have a lot of interesting things um, uh, to say about it. So, you know, I miss Dorothy and I would I would love I would love to see her again at an unsocial distance dinner. Yeah, that's great. OK, well, thank you guys for that. Um, I, I would like to meet Sister Corita. She sounded really <laughs> okay. cool. Um, so I'm going to turn to some questions now from our audience. And this is from Spence Olin. And uh, Professor Olin. Hi, asks, Spence. <laughs> <laughs> he says, as Julia mentioned uh, in her intro, certain issues contested in the 1960s remain contested today. And these include the relative significance and left-wing activism of class and race. Are there lessons from the 1960s to which we should pay special attention today as we seek properly to address each of them. So maybe John, you could take that. You know, I I know that I should say we all need to learn the lessons of the 60s. Historians often say things like that. But I feel that uh, today's radical movements, especially the last, uh, last summer, Black Lives Matter in particular, are much smarter, much more strategic, and much more effective than anything that happened in the 60s. They've attracted a much broader base of support. They're much more, they're much better at bringing together politics and protest. You know, Melina Abdullah of, of uh, Black Lives Matter talks about this a lot. They're very big on you got to vote in this election. She says, uh, you don't feel like voting in this election? Do it for Fannie Lou Hamer, she says. You know, a lot of black people fought and died so that you could vote. So. Let's let's do it for them. You're not that enthusiastic about some of our candidates. You should vote anyway. Um, but that doesn't mean you stop protesting. That doesn't mean you you keep quiet on your demands. They're able to negotiate, and, and they're campaigning very hard right now to get a new district attorney in Los Angeles. Um, looks like they're going to succeed. I mean, here's here's hoping. Uh, so I feel that today's movements are more successful, more strategic broader based, better at doing real politics and mixing it with radical movements, street action. Um, why, and much less involved with the kind of internecine battles, indeed murderous internecine balance that, that ruined a lot of the, um, the, the left of, uh, of the 60s. And it's, you know, one of the things we've been thinking about is, well, why is it? Why is it that today's Black Lives Matter is so much more effective than, than uh, Ron Karenga's Us or the, Black, uh, or, or the Black Panthers or SDS? You know, SDS dissolved in internecine battles, two different a split where each side expelled the other half from the organization. And, you know, the most important student group of the, of the era disappeared just, this, just when they were needed. <clears throat> It may be, some pe a lot of people have, have, have argued, and I think there's something to this. Black Lives Matter is, is a organization that was founded and is led by women. And somehow women aren't involved with the same kind of, dare I say, you know, ego trips as, uh, as a lot of the young men, at least of the 60s and 70s were. So I think a lot of the lessons of the 60s are negative lessons. You want to get away from that kind of internecine battle. You want to uh, be more democratic. You want to mix, uh, be able to mix um, regular voting politics with action in the streets. So uh, th that's my answer. Danny, what's your answer? Well, let me ask. I want to make sure we get enough questions in here. Yeah, yeah. So this one, maybe Danny, you want to take this next one. 
Um, this is from David Igler, and uh, who teaches history here at UC Irvine. And David asks uh, to both of you, but I'm going to pitch this one to Danny using that sp sports metaphor. Um, the 1960s seem like ancient history to many of our undergrads. Yeah. What advice do you have for connecting them to the movements and cultures of that era? And I bet that you're doing that all the time in your classroom work. So what do you do? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. Um, so one thing that I, I did this summer, I taught a California history class this summer. We actually got to use quite a bit of the book. Um, so I tried to present a kind of triple crisis, the Vietnam War, the mobilizations of um, like new social movements, you know, people of color, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian liberation struggle. Um, and the kind of um, challenges of the New Deal Great Society. So that last part didn't work exactly, but I tried to map it onto this issue of the present recession, COVID, and of course the, the police thing is constant. And it did seem to resonate with the students. And in some ways, the fact that the 1960s is now clearly a, a historical moment that's in the past, it creates a little bit of a platform where I think it's easier to um, detach ourselves from that moment. And there's lots of video material, which is fantastic. A lot of the shit is in color, so it's real resonant. The people were all good talkers, so that helps. Um, but you know, like for a person like me, I really cut my teeth in the anti-apartheid struggle and the Central American solidarity stuff. And of course the LAPD. So I, I was like always working with and against this legacy of the 60s. And it really shaped overwhelmingly my thinking about the world. And there's something very liberating about the people who I think start their political moment. It's probably 1994 up into the present. So it's the Zapatistas on through BLM, the world trade. So they've got a really totally, at the end of the day, a really different framing, right? So if you think about the old left as power for the workers and the new left as power to the people, we're really dealing with a community of movements that is very critical of the notion of power at all. And as a person who identifies really strongly with the old left and the new left, that I'm a little wary of that and it bothers me, which is probably, as John says, a good sign. It's an indication that something new and different is happening and at the very least, new mistakes are being made. Mm -hmm. So I would say after several years of, of really frustrating classroom experiences around trying to mobilize students um, along a level of material interest or social commitment or all that stuff and getting really a minority, all of a sudden there's a mass interest in the kinds of themes um, and struggles and questions that, that, yeah. that, get, that are getting raised. That's great, okay. Here's a question from, writer, teacher, and labor activist, Andrew Tonkovich. And he has outed himself as a longtime listener and reader, but a first time Zoomer. Okay, he says, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> this is a question for John. He says, his wife claims that John Wiener's smile can actually be heard on the radio. Oh. And he says that thousands of us love his KPFK and now Nation Magazine radio show. And they want to know, when were you first a guest on KPFK? And how did you get the gig at the station, which is so important to your and Mike's telling of the story of Rad LA? So a KPFK question for John. Well, um, there, um, the Nation magazine launched a syndicated radio program in the kind of mid to late 90s called Radio Nation. This was before there was the internet. Uh, you know, they made uh, put it put it up on the satellite. And it was based at KPFK. A guy named Mark Cooper, mentor of mine, um, founded this program. And because I wrote for the Nation magazine, I would be a guest on Radio Nation, which was recorded at KPFK and broadcast on KPFK. And because I was a good guest. Eventually, I became a guest host when Mark was out doing, you know, something in the real world. And um, be, after becoming a guest host, the KPFK management at that point decided, uh, let's give this guy a regular show because 
he seems to be able to do it. Uh, so it was kind of a winding path through um, another show, but I had a mentor who was a master of, of radio and indeed of radical journalism. And, uh, you know, I've been doing it ever since. And you should always smile when you're on the radio because people can tell. Great. Okay, here's a question uh, from Stephen Pasco, who's a graduate student. Or actually, I think maybe he's now a postdoc, Stephen, uh, in our history department here. And Stephen asks, um, to what extent was radical political culture in LA distinctive in relation to other parts of California, especially San Francisco and the Bay Area? I mean, this book really focuses on LA, but it's still really, really long. <laughs> So tell us about SF versus LA. Can I say two quick things about yeah, that? Please. So um, Stephen, it's a great question. Uh, and I would point you in two directions. The first is uh, there's a brother who teaches at San Francisco State named Jason Ferreira. He's in race and resistance studies and he's written a lovely dissertation that's being revised um, called All Power to the People about third worldism in San Francisco. Um, the key difference in terms of San Francisco and LA is twofold. San Francisco is only 49 square miles. You can walk from one end to the other in an afternoon, a couple hours. So the density produces a different kind of commingling between the um, radicalizing populations, the native community, the black community, the Chicano community, all right in, on top of each other. The second thing that's really different, I think, is that the destruction of the old left is much more effective in Los Angeles than it is um, in San Francisco. In San Francisco, you have people who are able to continue working at the docks in the 40s and 50s. So there's a great film by Billy Woodbury, it's called, And When I Die, I Won't Stay Dead, about Bob Kaufman, who was a black poet, you may know him, who was the guy who came up with the term beatnik. And Kaufman was a dock worker. He was a stevedore. He'd been in the National Maritime Union. He was banned and blacklisted. And Harry Bridges said, I don't give a shit. Come to San Francisco and you can work. And he worked two, three days a week. And the rest of the time they wrote poetry. So San Francisco was able to sustain certain institutions that I think were more difficult to sustain. And then the second part is that factory desegregation during the war advanced a little bit further. Like my grandmother couldn't get a job making tanks in LA or ships or aircraft. There was too much racial exclusion. So she spent the war in Richmond in the Ford plant making tanks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that meant that you had a more stable financial black community with a closer tie to industrial labor. Erica Huggins had been in the Panther Party said one time to me, you know, one of the things you got to understand about us is we were we grew up poor, but 90% of the Panthers had two parents, both working, and they lived in the home with them. So there also was a platform and a stability of that radicalism that I think exceeded what existed in LA slightly. And then the last thing, and I'll shut up, is that, you know, you have the sheriffs as well as the LAPD. You have the county as well as the city. So there's dual power in Southern California. A lot of the Chicano movement is aimed at the sheriffs and the county. And the Black Power movement is aimed at the city and the LAPD. Uh -huh. And the only place where those two struggles really converge on a repeated level is in the schools. Because Los Angeles Unified crosses that divide. And that's why when you talk about high school students, you'll find the links between black and brown in ways that you don't necessarily, as, as John and Mike wrote about, in other realms. So I think those are some of the distinctions. Great. Okay, we're almost out of time. So I got a question here from Wesley Chung. And first of all, he wants to know, where is Mike Davis? Mike wasn't <laughs> Bill that's speaking today, um, but maybe there's something that- you I can answer the question. <laughs> Mike- has moved on. Mike, I talked to him just yesterday. Mike is working on a book on the politics of COVID-19. He's been asked by a lot of people to write about the fires. And he has a piece at The Nation magazine right now about how the fires are transforming his, the historic transformation of the, of the forest ecology of California. And everyone wants to know what Mike thinks about the politics of, of the present election. So he's got three big things to write about. 
uh, none of which have much to do with LA in the 60s. Okay, and then Wesley also has a couple of very um, contemporary questions. Um, maybe if you can do these in 30 seconds. Mike Foyer wants to redistrict LA. Any comments? And Proposition 19, yes or no? Anyone want to take either of those or you want to, to, to rest on those for now? No? Okay. Um, so Diana Sahar, first of all, she says, great to see you, John. And she hopes that we'll give a signed copy to the UCI library. And she also wants us to remind people of what the book is called. It is Set the Night on Fire, LA in the 60s. And um, it's a fat, beautiful, wonderful book. I really, really recommend it. And we are going to be continuing this series. We also have Danny Widener's book, Black Arts West. Terrific yeah, book. Also recommend Indispensable. It. Indispensable work on culture and, and politics in post-war Los Angeles. Beautiful. And we are going to be continuing this Illuminaries faculty book talks featuring UCI faculty whose books are making a difference in arts and culture. And our next talk will be by my colleague, colleague Hector Tobar, uh, professor of literary journalism and Chicano Latino studies. And he just came out with a big beautiful novel called The Last Great Road Bum, which is about the true life of a guy named Joe Sanderson, a college dropout from Illinois who takes to the road in search of adventure and literary inspiration. And I'm about halfway through that one and it's a riot. And um, so I hope that you will come back on November 18th to hear uh, Professor Hector Tobar talking about that book. So you've been a great audience um, and we look forward to seeing you in November. And I just want to thank Danny and John for their fabulous presentation, conversation, thoughts, insight, all of it, humor tonight. Yeah, so, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Julia. And thank you, Danny. It's been great. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>